you know, prepped and ready for a lunch, uh, a lunch crowd um, in your restaurant. So I will share my screen. Uh, I hope everyone can see that. I know that I can't see anybody's face, so I'm just going to go with if I get a text message from my staff that I that they can't, um, please let me know. Uh, so good morning, everybody. If you don't know who I am, Scott Dolch. I'm the executive director of the Connecticut Restaurant Association. Uh, this webinar is is uh, a, a great one. Uh, we've had many uh, throughout this pandemic, 13 months, um, but a lot of a lot of really good things to talk about as an industry, as a hospitality, as a whole, uh, where we're going with the commissioner, which will give everyone an update, um, and looking ahead to uh, hopefully some some better days ahead, uh, normalcy coming. So uh, you guys know myself and. The commissioner, but before I turn it over to him, I have some housekeeping on just an association side and some questions on a federal side as we've been working. So, uh, kind of the topics I'll give everybody an update on the CRA, a National Restaurant Association update, um, the revitalization fund. Um, I know it's called the RRF, but I'll go into details. There's definitely a, a lot of folks that don't just define themselves as restaurants that will be eligible. Try to answer some of those questions. Um, uh, Connecticut legislative update. I will try to do my best to provide um, Nicole Griffin's working extremely hard for us as our contract lobbyist, um, working through some legislative uh, updates and things to try to help you guys. And then we will turn it over to the commissioner. So quick update. Um, you know, I, I just want to thank everybody, uh, our members uh, that, have, that have rejoined. I know what you guys are going through financially. Uh, so, you know, we've, we've had a great uptick in membership and dues over the last few months. And, and that means a lot that helps our association actually function and do what we try to do to help you guys. So we appreciate that. We'd love to continue to see new members. Um, you know, other things that we are, we are gonna continue to do. Um, I will get into it a little bit more, um, but please take advantage of our job board. Uh, the CRA job board, which we started, uh, what, a couple months ago. Um, it is a free for all members to post I understand worker shortage uh, is probably your biggest challenge. And this goes for all industries right now. Um, there's 140,000 people last time I checked on the DOL on unemployed. Um, I know our industry is probably looking for anywhere, but restaurants specifically anywhere between 30 and 40,000 jobs that are open right now. It is, there's a lot of different reasons. Um, we're trying to do everything we can as an industry um, and as an association to help you through that. Cause I understand it, you know, I've been on multiple calls this week with federal delegation. Um, I know David's heard this from me as well as the governor directly. There's been a couple articles and we're trying to find that solution because it's one thing to loosen restrictions but if you can't open your doors or be open the hours you wanna be or open to the capacity you wanna be without the staff um, it still makes it a huge challenge. So we understand, we hear you and we're trying to do everything we can um, to help that, and I can give some updates as we go forward. Um, serve safe manager classes, as you guys know, um, uh, the biggest thing on serve safe is uh, we we teach almost all of our classes now. We're going back to in person. We do four we four a month, usually every Monday. Uh, we know that's the best time for the industry. Uh, we still do the online and in person testing in our offices, and you can do it fully online now too. Um, please go to our website ctrestaurant.org/servesafe. Uh, to get recertified or help get your staff. There are discounts for members. Um, can, you know, we are one of the, the, the most inexpensive serve safe certifications, as well as we have two incredible teachers that have a 91 to 93% uh, passing rating. Uh, so you don't have to continue to pay to, to retake the test. They do a phenomenal job for in-person classes. So take a look at that. Make sure you're, you're signing up for those classes. They are starting to fill up very quickly. Um, you know, because I think people are starting to realize, you know, okay, stuff's get, starting to get back together and we need to get people certified. So, and then the last update for the CRA are two big events. Uh, we've set the date for our golf tournament, which will be June 28th at Lyman Orchards. Uh, it's a Monday, um, which we're excited for if any of you guys are golfers. And we're also working to have a farm to table type of dinner with some of the chefs afterwards. So even if you aren't a golfer, there'll be opportunities for you to participate. All those funds help our association. 
and please mark December 6th, as I see Phil Pappas in a second there on the screen, and even Bob Murdoch, everybody should fill, fill their calendar for December 6th right now. Uh, we are going to go back to Foxwoods. I'm looking for a record-breaking year, the Crazies, which is our annual awards gala. Um, it's going to have a whole new meaning this December as we continue uh, to highlight and recognize uh, how incredible our industry as a whole is. So I look forward to really getting everybody together in six, seven months and uh, think, you know, reflecting back, but enjoying a night out, um, an incredible dinner put together by Foxwoods catering team. We do an after party. I think we'll be at Shrine again with usually a concert or an artist will perform and our hotel room nights are like 79 bucks, 89 bucks a night. So for about $250, $300, you can have a great evening to celebrate our industry. So keep that date um, on your calendar as we move forward. If you have questions, let us know. Okay, uh, just a quick national update. Um, the Public Affairs Conference, I'm usually in Washington DC this week, meeting with all of our delegates. Uh, I was about a week before the pandemic started last year. Unfortunately, we had to do it all virtually this year. Um, but I do thank many of you, as I see names on here, have been on virtual calls with me with our delegates throughout the last um, three to four days. Um, as you see our seven delegates there, uh, our, our messaging was really thanking them for the, the, all the acronyms, the PPP, the ERTC, the SVO, and now the RRF, um, helping get that, get all these grant dollars would help, is really made such a difference in helping each of you stay afloat. Um, so we've talked about that. We talked about um, immigration reform, talked about some uh, other challenges. The worker shortage was a huge topic for discussion. Um, many, many of you shared with our delegates, which was great to hear and sharing your personal stories and how hard this is, um, you know, and, and you know, worker fatigue, overworking your staff and yourselves, uh, you know, great messaging points that I know um, as we've talked to each of these delegates, I think they're hearing loud and clear and hopefully gonna continue to, to work with us in our industry down in DC uh, in, in the coming, you know, months throughout the rest of the year to help us. So I appreciate that and just wanted to really let you guys know um, how important uh, this week is, you know, in, in our kind of our hill visits or our virtual hill visits. Um, but I've had multiple calls, as you guys know, with all of our delegates throughout the last 13 months, trying to help us um, and where we are. So, so we talk about financial support. Let's just kind of go through really quickly what the federal government has done um, through this process. And then I'll get into RRF. So Paycheck Protection Program. There is still money out there if you haven't gotten a second draw, even a first draw the first time. Uh, there's still uh, unallocated dollars that are there to apply, work with your bank, go th you know, it goes through SBA. Um, the first and second draw, I believe our industry as a whole has done anywhere between 65 and $70 billion back um, across the country. Uh, you guys know the PPP program will continue to be here to help you hopefully get fully, um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a forgivable loan, but hopefully fully forgiven on both those um, programs. Um, the ERTC, if you haven't looked into the ERTC, you can still work with your bookkeeper, your CPA and others. It's another program to, you know, a credit based off of your employees that you've kept on or you have them working right now based on restrictions or not fully back. Um, it is a is an unbelievable program. I've heard many restaurants and others talk to me about it. So please reach out to us if you don't, if you aren't looking into the ERTC, please do. Um, you, you can do PPP as well as ERTC, as well as, you know, even idle. Um, there's a lot of um, part of this. And then the shelter, the SVO, the Shuttered Venue Operator Grant Program, that went live, I think, early last week. Um, some hiccups with it, but, you know, they're trying to work through that with the SBA. Uh, I'm kind of glad SVO went first before RRF, um, but there's, you know, $15 billion in there. Um, you know, many of, I was in some tourism meetings this week. Many folks um, in that kind of aquarium museum, lot, you know, performance venues, hopefully are gonna receive some of those dollars in our back to our state to help them. Cause we, as we know, as restaurants, we need hospitality and tourism to come back. Um, if it doesn't, um, if business travel doesn't come back, it's only gonna have a huge effect on our recovery as an industry. Cause we all know when you travel out of state or you travel into Connecticut, you're looking for restaurants um, to, to go and dine in um, as well as, you know, uh, so many other factors. So the RRF program, just to, uh, all right, I just want to go through just some updates and I'll do the best I can. Um, uh, you know, luckily, no questions in the chat yet, but it is $28.6 billion. Uh, phenomenal. It is a restaurant specific fund. 
Um, but when I use the word restaurant, I use that because there's a lot of eligible entities and I put all of those on here today so you guys understand who is eligible, um, you know, out of the $28.6 uh, billion. So it's restaurants, food stands, food trucks, food carts, caterers, bars, saloons. I know we don't call them saloons here, but remember, this is a across the country, lounges, taverns, snack, and non-alcoholic beverage bars. Uh, anybody that's in those categories uh, already, you know, is eligible based on your uh, gross receipts 2019 uh, compared to your gross receipts 2020, the difference, uh, you're eligible. Um, and then also bakeries, brew pubs, tasting rooms, tap rooms, breweries, microbreweries, wineries, distilleries, and inns, all on-site sales for those that, that second category, all on-site sales to the public comprise at least 33% of gross receipts. Using that as an example, if you're a brewery, your tap room in 2019, your gross receipts have to be over 33% for you to be eligible. If you do all really delivery and your sales are more driven um, by selling beer to package stores or to restaurants, as opposed to the tap room, um, same with bakeries or, or you know, the wineries. But if you do that, do that and have a robust tap room, um, you know, you're gonna be eligible as well. How the money breaks down. Uh, out of the 28.6, 23.6 billion is available um, for everybody. So the first 5 billion is going to go to businesses with growth re gross receipts of a half a million dollars or less um, during 2019. Then the other kind of, and then I also heard yesterday through SBA um, that there will be a, a minimum of 4 billion, maybe 5 billion out of the 23.6 for restaurants or businesses between the 500,000 to 1.5 million. Um, I think there'll be a lot more in that category, but they wanna make sure that the larger restaurant groups do not take the, the bulk of this. Um, so, you know, the, there is a $5 billion hold for the smallest of the small to make sure if you are a small um, restaurant or your small bar or your small food truck or whatever that it might be or caterer, um, you're, you're going to have a pot of money that other people aren't going to be eligible for. Um, maximum, the total amount of a grant that you're, you're able to get as a business entity is $10 million and limited to $5 million per location. Um, and you will need to deduct the first and second draw of PPP. Uh, with David on here, so he knows, I actually got some clarity because uh, there's a question across the country. Any other, any idle any other federal dollars, any state dollars that you've received did not count towards gross receipts. So the CARES Act grant, the $5,000 grant, that would not count as gross receipts. It's only PPP that you are deducting um, out of this program. Um, uh, just looking at some of the questions, can you use it if it closes temporarily to move to a new location? As long as you are not permanently closed. Uh, there's a lot of questions on, on all of this and we're trying to still get the clarity with the SBA. But if you did not permanently close, if you're temporarily closed and you're looking to reopen, you should be eligible. If you opened in 2020 and don't have full 2020 versus 2019, you are still eligible. There's a different uh, formula through SBA. Also, if you opened in 2021 or you're about to open, some of the eligible expenses, you are eligible to, to receive grant dollars. So everybody is really open to this program as opposed to PPP where you had to be open prior to February 15th or whatever that the, those numbers were. This is a different program. This is trying to help everybody, whether you've opened temporarily closed or you've stayed open throughout the process. If you have permanently closed, however, you will unfortunately like not be eligible. So that's a big question we've started to ask the S, uh, Small Business Development Center, um, you know, as, as, as we continue to kind of work through this. Um, we work with the SBA. I can't, I can't thank Catherine, uh, our district director enough from the SBA for all. I mean, she got thrown directly into the fire here, uh, starting in her role with PPP and everything else, but she has worked tirelessly. Her team has, and we'll continue to do webinars. I don't want to get too much into the weeds today on this program because I'm only giving you secondhand information as I get it. Um, I, but I, I still want to be that resource. The other, other thing is this program available for private clubs. I think there's some caveats in that, how that defines if you're eligible or not. Um, you know, you really have to be doing the majority of your business has to be food and beverage. 
that's where that 33% threshold really is. Um, if you kind of, I think there's questions on membership dues and things like that. They really want to target our hotel restaurants eligible. I think if you have separate LLCs um, or there's some, there's some caveats, a great question. We are trying to get answers to that as well. Um, should you still apply for gross receipts or less than 2020 versus 2019? Um, I, my, my opinion is you should be looking to apply. And this is actually my last, last message on RRF. Um, there's still a lot of questions to be answered. There's a lot of money that's that's coming into this program, which is phenomenal, but it is a first come first serve program right now. So everybody across the country is on these webinars, especially in our industry, learning more and more about this program. So everybody that has a chance to apply and is eligible for funds will be open to apply what they're doing, which I didn't talk about, but the if you are a women owned over 51% or more uh, female owned business, a minority owned business, a veteran owned business, there's a couple other categories, distressed and everything else that you could be eligible for. You will be open first. They are saying as early as some point next week, they could open up the application process just for those categories. And then I know with Catherine, you know, they've mentioned that on day eight, they will uh, open up for everyone else, even though they won't do anything with that until day 22, because there's a 21 day gap of trying to help those uh, the, you know, the, the veteran owned, female owned and minority owned businesses. Um, but what I'm telling you guys is this is a in the queue where you fall in. It doesn't matter if you've been, you, you, you should receive more or less or where you're located, who, if you're a restaurant or a bakery, it doesn't matter. So as soon as you click submit my application, you, you're going to be in the queue and get a, whether you see the number or not, the SBA is going to be listing you as a number and they're going to go down and, and provide grants until the money runs out. That's the way the program's set up. So my, my advice to everybody is the SBA last week, I'm sorry, on Monday, or they updated on Monday, they have a sample application. It's called Form 3172. Um, I believe Yvette has put it on there. Thank you, Yvette. Um, please go through that sample application this weekend. Make sure you have all your information. If you have questions, the Small Business Development Center and Matt and his team has been phenomenal. Uh, there's no cost to use the SBDC. They're, they're an arm really of, of David's group as well as you know they're working with SBA. Uh, they're, they're phenomenal at answering questions as well. Use them to make sure your application is accurate. If it is inaccurate and you get declined by the SBA and they say you need to get more information, let's play a hypothetical game here. Let's say you go in and submit it and you're 641, you have to pull it fix it and then put it in two days later and you become 64,141. And there you go, potentially getting funding. So you need to make sure that before you hit submit that your application is as accurate as it can be um, and make sure you go through that. Uh, as I see folks here, um, you know, reach out to SBDC for personal advisors. Um, we are actually gonna do a Spanish uh, only version of, of our webinars, uh, ne hopefully next week. Because uh, I know there's a lot of business owners that English isn't their first language, and we want to make sure the questions that you guys have, we we want everybody in the state of Connecticut to apply. Uh, my job is not to, you know, Catherine's job and, and SBA will have to deal with this program and make sure we try to get as much of those dollars back to Connecticut. That's my my view of this. You know, I know that everyone always says, hey, about 1%, David, David and I talk about about 1% of ARP or other things come back to, to our state. That's not the case in this program. Um, so, you know, it's all about when do, we, when do Connecticut businesses submit and where do they fall on the line and is their money still left over and do they receive funds? Um, so when you say all that, there is a big concern about the 28.6 running dry very, very quickly. That is part of my discussion with the delegates this past week um, down in D.C. to say where they'll replenish the funds like first draw the PPP if that comes. And there was a lot of support in that. I know this program hasn't been launched yet but I'm already getting it in their mindset to say, hey, the SBA will know very quickly once the probably the first week of applications or probably second week when all applications are in, how much is being asked. And my whole fight here is to make sure every single eligible restaurant in, or brewery or food stand, food truck in Connecticut can receive funding. Um, and we're gonna learn that over the next two to three to four weeks. The application process could open as early as next week. Um, so I continue to drive that home is I know it's a lot of work. I know you can be like, I don't know if I'm going to get something or not. Go through the process. 
it's, you know, the worst case you could do is put together an application, submit it. it it's no, you know, that is, this is purely grant dollars to the last part of RF. This is grant money. This is not a forgivable loan. You will not go through a bank. You will submit to the SBA and the SBA through treasury will cut you a grant check. Then you get a chance to use it pretty much for everything that you need for expenses on your restaurant. I believe as I went through some webinars, you can use it to pay back idle loans and, and expenses you've had. You can use it, you know, all the way up until March, uh, I believe March 11th, 2023. Um, so this is a substantial, this is an unbelievable program. Um, I know a lot of people are very hesitant and still like, am I going to get something? Am I going to, am I not? We don't know that yet, but you know, selfishly for the state of Connecticut, let's, let's lead the country in the amount of applications and getting as many of you guys into the system and into the queue. So you're high on the queue and get funding. Um, and you know, we'll, I'll continue to fight for more dollars to make sure whether you apply at 801 on certain date, or you don't get it in until 835 that morning. I don't, I really don't love the, in the queue where you list first come first serve. I said that I shared that with Senator Blumenthal yesterday. He gets that, but at the end of the day, cause I have no skin in the game. I want to make sure we get, we get as many of those dollars back to our state as possible. So that is, I'll take a breath. That is RRF um, as best as I can. I, you know, I, I see there's other questions. There's a lot of weeds questions um, that I don't know if I can fully answer this morning. Um, but again, uh, we're going to have more uh, RRF. I, I just, I highly suggest going on SBA site. They have program details. They have the sample application. They go through, I, I took a lot of this off their website this morning. Um, you know, what defines the women owned, uh, minority owned, how you're gonna self-certify if you're a veteran owned business, make sure you start doing that process now. Um, because again, it's about being in the queue and where you're listed in the queue. So uh, those are my updates on RRF. I'm just going back through, I don't know if I missed anything else, but I'm happy to take questions afterwards because um, it's not the whole purpose of today's call. All right, just quickly, just a state, state legislative update. Um, put a picture in there of the governor, Tyler Anderson and myself, um, what happened last week. Uh, I know Commissioner Lehman unfortunately was not there, but Deputy Commissioner Glendalyn was there in the background. Um, this was the signing of expanded outdoor dining. Uh, this was the bill signing at Millwrights in Simsbury. Um, this is something we have been working on with the governor's team, as you guys know, the silver lining of the pandemic to be able to get expanded outdoor dining back in May of 2020. That saved a lot of your restaurants. Um, this bill is now officially signed. It is into law. You are able to pretty much everything you did last year outdoors with patios, grass areas, parking lots. You have to get make sure you work with your town. Let's not talk about, hey, I'm just going to do it. Make sure your town knows what you're doing. If you're doing something different than last year, you need to talk to your town and make sure they're okay with it. Um, but we are trying to promote alfresca dining as much as possible in our state this spring, summer, fall, even going back to the greenhouses next winter. You will be able to do this all the way up in igloos all the way through March, the end of March, 2022. Um, so it's a great, it was a great, you know, uh, a great day at Millwrights with, with bipartisan support to get this unanimously uh, passed and then signed into law. Um, those are things that we work on, as you guys know. Um, and then, you know, the other piece to this, I put a couple other things just to quickly talk about. I know Nicole I think is on, but Nicole is our rock star as our contract lobbyist, all the effort that she goes into of trying to uh, work with, with legislators every day and keeping us in the loop on bills that are out there. Um, the current executive orders have been extended through May 20th, um, but beyond that, that's a question as commissioner will talk about uh, where we go from here. Um, also, other things that we're looking at, to-go alcohol that has come out of committee we're being told hopefully as early as next week, the house will vote on it. That bill will allow you to do to go alcohol for the next three years. Um, very similar to, to what you've been doing. Uh, won't really change much, but you'll be able to continue it beyond May 20th and for another three years. Uh, we hope to see that on the house floor as early as next week and then get to the Senate and get passed before May 20th and we'll continue to push for that. Third party delivery consent that came out of the commerce committee. Um, there's still some work on that. I know everyone wants to cat fees. That's a much longer discussion that I can't fully get into today, but at least on the consent side, we are trying to limit any of these companies coming in and just taking your menu, taking your, your business and putting it up on their website without your consent um, or even a contract and those things. So we're working through that. 
uh, as we go forward. Um, unemployment insurance, you guys probably saw, um, you know, the bipartisan information about a reform uh, that the governor talked about earlier this week with, with CBIA. We're trying to continue to work. We know that there's a $712 million deficit in the unemployment trust uh, right now, and that'll affect the businesses, not the taxpayers. If we don't hopefully use some ARP, American Rescue Plan dollars to offset that, but there was a reform to kind of help your, your ratings, help you know the base pay, and, and there was, it, was, uh, it was great to see bipartisan support. It's something they've actually been working on since 2008, I believe. So um, we hope to get that done as well, but we're keeping a close eye on UI in the trust so you guys know. There's also still continue to talk about grants, state, state dollars, state programs, uh, you know, issues on your permitting, um, you know, extra cost, everything there, tax relief, talking about the 1%, you guys maybe saw that, uh, trying to figure out creative ways to bring more dollars back to your business to help your business. We'll continue to keep you guys abreast and pro posted on that. And then other things, predictive scheduling came out of the labor committee. We're gonna keep a close eye on that bill. As you guys all know, it's very similar to years past. Um, and then there's also the environmentally friendly styrofoam container plastic straws. And I'm gonna talk about this on another webinar, um, just trying to not do anything to make it harder for you to run your business with the explosion, explosion in costs, uh, the sourcing of food, sourcing a product, and how hard it is to even run your business right now. So we'll continue to work through these issues. There's many others. These are kind of some of the high level stuff that we're dealing with at a state. Understand June 9th is the end of legislative sessions so or about you know, 40 days uh, away from that. Um, so, you know, there's a lot still to be had. If you guys know the session at all, it's like cramming for a mid you know, the end of year in college, everything gets done in like the last three to four weeks. So it'll get very crazy for, for us. And we'll be calling on you guys to help us hopefully get a lot of this stuff done. So, wow, that was, that was a lot. Um, I apologize for probably talking too much information, but I hope that was helpful. Um, I'm going to turn it over. Uh, he is in the car showing his video. Um, you know, I, I just I just before I let him talk, I, I want you guys to know uh, the commissioner has been, as you guys know, has been a huge advocate, not only for restaurants, but for hospitality. Um, realistically, where we're going to with May 1st, May 19th um, has, has a lot to do with his efforts with the governor's administration. But on so many other levels, uh, his team with Glendalyn and everything else, I just can I, I thank you, David, for being on this morning um, and uh, allowing uh, you to kind of share the news of where we're going and, and questions that people have. Thanks, Scott. Can you all hear me all right? Perfect. Yes. All right, I will, uh, I will, I will try to be, uh, be brief here and answer any questions. And I think the message actually from us is, is simple. Uh, you know, the last time we did this webinar, I think it was a couple of months ago, and we talked about eliminating capacity restrictions, but maintaining spacing, which we realize, you know, by, by default, basically impacted capacity for many of you. And, and that's a, a similar framework that we're using right now. We're really trying to focus on what we believe is a key mitigant here as we get to the end of this pandemic. Uh, in, in Connecticut was the first day with the announcement this past Monday, I believe, in, not only in New England, but also in the Mid-Atlantic, you know, to signal an end to really all restrictions and we'll talk about mass indoors here but the goal is to really provide clarity to restaurants hospitality the public to, to plan what we think is going to be a normal summer and a really good summer from an activity and business perspective so you know the two parts of the announcement first may, may 1st uh the curfew which i know we have left in place that has been a, a tool that we thought has been helpful i realize that's not been great for this group but moving it back to midnight uh, as of may 1st and then outdoors, uh, no table size restrictions. Currently we're at eight indoors and outdoors. Uh, and then uh, lastly on May 1st, but perhaps more importantly, the food with alcohol requirement, which I realize has been hard to comply with at times, certainly for many businesses, uh, that is no longer. So uh, outdoor bars uh, can and will open on May 1st, breweries, et cetera, wineries. Uh, and we have updated our website before I go to May 19th, just for those that haven't seen the sector rules, they're already updated. So I know there's a question that will come up, but stand up drink service is permissible. So a bar outside on May 1st can look like a bar in, in 2019, uh, with the exception of when people are not eating or drinking, when they're going to the restroom, for example, we are requiring masks still at that point in time, but stand up alcohol service, it will be permitted outdoors as of May 1st. Shifting to the 19th, um, so here, th this is the bigger part of the announcement, and, and really it's an elimination of, of all business restrictions. So capacity, food with alcohol, 
I can go through the, the many of the curfews, obviously going away the table, size limitations, anything, anything that we were imposing as it relates to the pandemic will be no longer at that date. Um, and the only thing that will be remaining is masks uh, and masks indoors. And the governor was asked this question again yesterday, will it be a mandate? Will it be a gui guidance? Uh, right now we anticipate masks being required indoors a bit longer. And again, that's when people are not eating or drinking, when you're going through the grocery store, when they're going to the bathroom in the restaurant. Um, we, we just think that's gonna be needed. It's not clear when that's gonna go away or when that's gonna become guidance. I actually would like this group's view on, you know, should it be guidance or should it be a mandate? I've heard both sides of the story. I think there were, issues in Texas, for example, where they made it not a mandate, you know, then you have businesses that are dealing with certain customers that, you know, and making other customers uncomfortable. There's not a, in my opinion, at least, I think keeping it a mandate for a little while longer when until we think it's not needed is probably easier on the community and businesses. But I, I definitely would appreciate this group's view. If you guys want to be dealing with that at each restaurant specific level and prefer it to be guidance, you know, that's feedback that I, I certainly welcome. But again, May 19th, you know, we expect it to be a, a normal Memorial Day, a normal summer. Um, and uh, we're really excited about working with this group. There's still lots of the, the good funding that Scott mentioned through the feds. I, I want to just underscore the point, apply. You know, a, a lot of this is first come, first serve. And those that are being aggressive and assertive are getting the money. And Connecticut's done a great job at getting a lot of these federal monies, even more than our fair share in many instances. And, and we want to keep doing that because that really helps the economy and, and maintain these businesses. Last thing I would say, and then I'm happy to go to questions, is the governor is going to make an announcement later today on, on ARPA and the rescue plan and what Connecticut is thinking about doing with some of its rescue plan dollars. Um, and there's going to be a focus on many things, but one of which is going to be focused on you know, tourism and marketing and, and how can we make sure with some of this pent up demand, especially on the leisure side, how can we really make sure that we're showcasing Connecticut and some of the tailwinds that we have uh, in terms of new residents in the state, but also tourists in the state. So happy to answer any questions, Scott. It's been really great uh, working with you and the team over the past year as well. And um, I'm very excited for, uh, for May 19th and getting back to normal here. No, thanks, David. Uh, remember, use the, uh, use the chat. Um, so I guess, David, one of the questions people have for me on May 1st is um, you said walk-up service um, allowed for a bar outside, which is great. But, you know, and, and I guess two part question here, uh, mass mandate outside or bar area or, or like, what are you guys as the DCD? Like, I know, you know, you still kind of have some re restrictions and requirements inside, but how, you know, when you think of some of these restaurant bars or down by the, the shoreline, you know, how, how would you, what are best practices or also what are going to be requirements for, for people that, that are going to open up their bars outside? Yeah, I, I think the simplest way to think about it is if someone's not eating or drinking, again, typically if they're moving, if they're going to an area of the restaurant or the bar, if they're going to the bathroom, you know, we'd ask them to mask up. And, and by the way, I think it's good business still to do this because I'm not sure. I think customers are going to be inspired a bit more with the confidence. But if someone's, you know, standing with a group of friends with a beer or a cocktail, then no, they obviously don't need to put a mask on between sips. Um, so if you're stationary and you're, and you're drinking or eating, no mask. But if you're moving around outside or indoors, as of May 1st, we're going to ask for masks to be worn. And then on May 19th, again, we anticipate just the indoor mask requirement to continue. So outdoors, if you're going to your table, for example, or going to a place in the bar, no masks needed. But I think simply for this group, we should be encouraging people to, to wear, wear masks when they're eating and drinking, excuse me, when they're not eating and drinking. Um, and then when they are eating or drinking or, or standing with a group of friends, they don't need to be wearing a mask. No, it's... Great. So I guess the second part um, of that question is, you know, a lot of our talk on bar seating had always been seated with a meal, which needs to continue, I'm assuming, through to inside until May 19th. But, inside only, correct. Yes. But outside, can you have a high top table like with, a, with people standing around it drinking as long as they stay space, like, like using your best interest, but yeah. obviously not trying to jam a bar, but like People want to stand as a party, like over in the corner, they can have their mask down drinking beer Absolutely. or cocktail. Okay. Um, yeah, three or four people, just uh, view that as three or four people standing is the same as a table indoors or outdoors. They can take their masks off. They're just standing and doing it. That's totally fine as we first outside. And then, you know, I, I've had some conversations with a lot of restaurateurs since this announcement. And, and I think David makes a really good point, everybody, you know, and, and I've, I've tried to clear this up with a lot of the media folks as well is we still have to be leaders and there's still, whether or not there's restrictions or they're just recommendations, this is about consumer confidence. 
like like as much as people want to go people i don't think want to go back to three deep at the bar or i don't want to be seated at the bar and someone leaning over me probably wanting to get a beer um i think i think i really want to drive that home to everybody here that like you know it you have to understand your customers and how they feel and i think like easing into it as i've talked to a couple bars you know what they're going to try to do um you know tim cabral and i had a great conversation yesterday and i think that you know you guys have done that already. You know what your customers like, what they feel good. People have told me on their glass partitions instead of Plexi or even some of their Plexi, they're going to leave it up um, for, uh, for a period of time, whether I need it or not. Um, but, you know, you, you really, everything does go to recommendations on May 19th. But I also have been very clear because a lot of you guys have shared that with the media that it doesn't mean you're just going to flip a switch or rip off the Band-Aid and go back to, uh, you know, pre, pre, you know, 2019 pre-COVID. So, I, I really do make sure you guys take that to heart because um, the last thing we need is is any of the, the media or whatever else continuing to say that, you know, yes, you can you, you need to use your best judgment, um, but also understand that this is not 2019. This is, you know, the, the more that we can do, uh, the better, you know, the more we can do to make people feel comfortable and continue to show that we're leaders in this, uh, you know, the, the better we are. So seating at an outlet. So just looking at quick Scott, options. can I just can I yeah, just weigh in on that point? I, I I would and again, you guys will know your customers, right? We we we're, the message from us is post the nineteenth, we're getting out of the rules business. You know, we we've been trying to to simplify things for a while, and these rules around dance floors and food with alcohol. I mean, we we want to make things easier for this group, but I think you you know the consumer confidence point is critically important. My personal view is I think you know seeing waiters and waitresses in mass, seeing plexiglass. I think that's going to be important for the consumer in the late spring and perhaps even early summer. So, you know, that's going to be up to, to, to you all. But I, I think consumers are still going to want to see those types of precautions, um, you know, again, for better or for worse. So we'll see where we go, but it's not required. Uh, but I, I, I think it will help your business. At least. Um, and then the other couple questions, David, uh, and I think it's just kind of as we talk through it, obviously outside on May 1st, you're not going to have really a mass mandate anymore as long as someone's sitting and eating, but uh, like your staff still needs to stay masked because they're going to be walking inside to go get food back and forth. And I think that's also best. Like, is there a mandate that the staff has to wear a mask um, because they're not eating and drinking? Outside? Yeah, no, that, yes. Yeah, no, the st staff will still be wearing masks because again, they're going to, the, the, not to get too deep into the weeds, but this gets, this is not a sector rule, but the governor's executive order is if you're, you know, if you're, uh, within six feet of someone indoors or outdoors, you do need to wear a mask. So again, I think the simplest way is if you're, if you're moving around indoors or outdoors prior to the 19th, masks should be worn, staff and guests. And then post the 19th, it'll just be indoors. Um, question come up, uh, can nightclubs open on May, May 20th or May 19th? Yes, again, there are no restrictions except for masks. So, you know, there can be a, a, a 10,000 person concert at 100% capacity on May 20th. You know, for example, the, the, the NCAA lacrosse tournaments are going to be uh, in Hartford this year. And the NCAA is, is contemplating 20,000 people there, and that's Memorial Day weekend. So there are, there are no restrictions after the 19th, except for the indoor, indoor masks again. And we're still discussing how that's going to be rolled out. Another question that comes up a lot, and we talk about it, David, is our back of house, our, our kitchen staff having to wear a mask when, especially as the, the temperature starts to turn and it's 125 degrees. And I want to get into the vaccination question in a little bit in a second, but um, is that because they don't have interaction with front of house, let's just say hypothetically with CDC guidelines, have you guys thought at all about like a work environment where you have four cooks in the back that you know, because they're double vaccinated, they would not need to wear a mask or what, where, have you guys had that conversation at all? Just because. So, yeah. And uh, we're, listen, we're starting to, and, and I, at some point, you know, masks are going to become guidance and then no longer is my perspective. We just don't know when, and it's tough to say that's going to be the 19th or June 1st. I'm sensitive to the point, especially with the heat in the summer. And, and, you know, right now to your point, Scott, 60% of Connecticut has been has gotten one dose that'll be obviously 60 percent two doses a month from now and we think somewhere between 70 and 75 percent of the state even with some of the hesitancy we're encountering uh, you know it's going to be a uh, single dose vaccinated by uh, the middle to end of may so we're, we're definitely going to be adjusting you know we're, the cdc is probably going to be adjusting as well so stay tuned on that but at some point what you're going to see not not a mandate in my opinion 
on mass and it'll become guidance. And, and there will likely be a bifurcation between those that are vaccinated, perhaps, and those that are not. But we're gonna, we're gonna need to follow what the federal government's uh, recommending there too, in many ways. No, I appreciate it. I think it's just a continued discussion because it's almost like a health hazard, you know, when it gets that hot and the, the, they've done a phenomenal job, all the chefs on this call here and their staff. Um, you know, I, 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 I've seen it firsthand. I haven't, w haven't had to do it myself, but it's something we should talk about. But I did want to drive that home a little bit, David, um, with everybody here, more of a PSA. Um, so everyone knows the reason why we're here and we were the first uh, state in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic to make this announcement. Rhode Island made an announcement yesterday. It looks like Massachusetts now is going to. We kind of were the first domino. Um, the main reason why we're here is not only because of all the efforts you guys have done to keep numbers down and everything else, but also because of vaccines. Um, we can't mandate any of our staff. We shouldn't be mandating any of our staff to get a vaccine, but we need to be encouraging it. And, and I hope many of you, uh, I get my second shot next Tuesday. I'm excited for it. Um, I know many of you have gotten your first or second, but you know we need to encourage folks to uh, that want to get a shot, help them. I know I've gotten a lot of calls on, hey, my back of house is nervous. They don't know where to go. I need to try to help them. You know, are there mobile clinics? Can we do something for hospitality in my town or in West Hartford or you know Farmington Valley? As I've talked to Jennifer up here, um, please reach out to us to help. That we, we need to. You know, I know the governor talked about this a lot on his press conference yesterday that 60%, 61% of adults have had one shot in the arm and they hope to get to 70. But you've seen states in the South, if you haven't followed national news that have hit a plateau. Uh, they're starting to turn away and throw away vaccines, not bring them into the state. Um, it's a huge issue. And you know, the more that we can continue to vaccinate the, the adults, the better it's going to be to eliminate the mass, eliminate some of the challenges. Um, and I, I'm curious to know what your staff, and you know, our staff is made up mainly of 20, 30, and 40 year olds. Um, they're in the demographic that's looking for a vaccine right now or are able to get it obviously, but trying to really increase that number. And I welcome ideas from each of you guys. Um, obviously I posted a picture with my nurse uh, that gave me my first, I'll do it again with a shirt Tyler gave me, support local restaurants. Um, but anything that each of you guys can do uh, to encourage, you know, what vaccines, you know, the vaccines are the, are the reason why we are actually seeing light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I welcome you guys to reach out to your public health departments, um, encouraging them, how can I help? I think, you know, the team at Rhines is a perfect example in Vernon. They did a, a mobile vax unit for their staff uh, one day, which is incredible. Um, you know, but, but those things I, I ask, I encourage and I ask for your guys' support and help so we can get to May 19th and we can get even beyond it and see the other side of this pandemic. Um, and, and that's, you know, my PSA for the day for you folks. I, I didn't even really talk to David about it, but we will continue to drive that message home as an association. When people ask me, how do we, you know, my, my counterparts in other states that are jealous that we have these dates out there and, and we're getting to a point of elimination of business restrictions. A lot of that has to do with the efforts of the governor's administration and getting the vaccines. We're third in the country per capita but we need to continue that and prove that, you know, we can get more folks uh, vaccinated as possible. So uh, any photos, you know, showcasing it, talking about it, it just, it's a topic for discussion. We're trying to think of other ways, other ideas that will continue to float out with everybody here. Um, but I, I definitely need to make sure that PSA and any ideas you guys have that we can help as a CRA promote that, um, it matters. I can tell you that it matters. And when you hear negative feedback from your staff, or others of why they don't want to get a vaccine, you know, let us know. Um, it, it helps us too, and I can bring it back to David and to the to Josh and, and Deidre and others because you know we need to continue to lead the country, um, and that's why we we are where we are. So, um, David, I don't know if you have to chime in at all on the vaccine piece, but I just want to make sure I was clear with that. No, no, you're very clear. Listen, any, anything we can do, we're, we're we're nation leading as a state per capita, but we need to keep our foot on the gas and. This, as Scott mentioned, this is directly related to getting rid of these restrictions, right? We don't want to move that 19th day back. So the, the quicker we can get to 70, 75 plus percent, the better, you know, eight, over 85% of our 65 and older population is now vaccinated, which really is going to limit the, the, the deaths and hospitalizations going forward. But we just need to keep leaning on it as a state and it, it's going to directly accrue to our benefit in terms of activity levels business-wise. So, um, 
I'm just trying to look to see any guidance for indoor music. Uh, there will be no there there will be no mandates, Tim. Um, it's a good question, but you know if you want to have music uh, on May 19th, May 20th inside, um, you know there there'll be no business restrictions on that uh, for your folks. Just like like David had said, if if people are going to have a concert inside, um, potentially the Xfinity Center, uh, you know Xfinity Lounge uh, place down there on Front Street can reopen and have a concert again, and obviously. You know, we're going to have to see how that plays out and works through. But but yes, for inside your restaurant, um, you can even, you know, do it, have a, have vocalists now with restrictions. But a lot of those restrictions will be even more uh, lifted on that date. Um, I, I think I answered that, obviously, in the buffet restrictions. There are no for those. We lifted the buffet in the sense that is right now you can have a buffet open and people can go through and receive food. As long as they have a, they have their mask on and they're six foot separated, they can go through and serve their own. Um, they do not need a, a staffer. We eliminated that, I think, back on March 19th. So you can actually be open with a buffet, um, but you can fully go back to two lines of a buffet, um, you know, probably mask inside, but outside you can play that how you see fit. Um, but you can do even more uh, beyond the May, May 1st, May 19th. So, so that's like the third buffet question I see. Um, you can have music now, Nancy, yes, but there's a little bit of restrictions. You want to keep the 12 foot spacing from the vocalist. Um, you know, there's, there's the recommendation to have a vocalist have a, have a, a negative test. You know, it's a recommendation, not a requirement, but you can have music now. Yes, but, but more hey, to Scott. the question. Go ahead, David. So I just, one thing I want to mention, I saw this in the chat before, and I, I should have mentioned this, that the, yeah, I mean, the reality, you, you can do music now, as you were saying, because no, no restrictions. I'm going to keep saying that after the 19th, except for masks. So everything, again, everything you did in 2019, you guys can do uh, after May 20th. Again, with the, with the one caveat, just make the customers are going to have an expectation in terms of sanitation, and we'll have to figure that out and see what the customer demand is. The point I wanted to make, though, is um, DPH recommendations. So the, the D Department of Public Health, and we'll work with them on this at DCD, is going to put out recommendations for large events and concerts. So we haven't quantified what that means, 500, 1,000 or more. These will be guidelines, uh, but then we're going to talk about things like, you know, it's all the stuff that you all, you all know, you know, encouraging testing most likely, encouraging spacing uh, at ingress and egress points. So that's coming. It'll probably be out next Friday. It might be a little bit longer, but I don't, I don't expect any surprises there. And again, that will be guidelines, but it'll look very similar to what you've seen from us in the past. We're just trying to put out some best practices because we get asked the question from, from folks on what, what, what they should do, even if it's not mandated. Sorry, Scott, that was the point I wanted to make. No, no, it's great. David, question that came up, which is a good one. Dance floor, is that considered moving around outside and inside with in regards to mass? Um, well, no, let, no, dance floors, people can be dancing um, outside without mass. I think that's fine. If they, if they really want to be cute, they can just keep their beer in their hand while they're doing it. Okay, um, but inside until the 19th and- Yeah, in indoors, yeah, indoors the 19th, nothing's really changing. Now, outdoors, I think there's just flexibility on that. You know, I, I think we're trying to keep um, family members together in, indoors and, and trying to limit the mask. You know, for someone that's moving around, again, <laughs> we can debate what dancing is, but I, I would say indoors, yeah, that shouldn't change. But outdoors, if someone wants to dance without a mask, yeah, no, no one's gonna be saying anything about that. Okay. Um, not to, you talked a little bit, not to jump over from restrictions and dates, um, but you talked a, a briefly, David, about ARP um, and a couple questions I maybe have for you and you can maybe give some clarity to everybody here. So I know tourism you guys are looking at, but um, I, I've heard some, some talk about, you know, there were supposed to be county dollars. We don't have, we have counties, but we don't have county, you know, um, departments, uh, but even the municipalities, but, uh, you know, should our restaurants and others be having those conversations? Will there be dollars? You know, I talked to Mayor Bronin the other day, and I'm going to follow up with him um, about, you know, like, uh, is that something where uh, you guys, as, as where you guys sit, will be more involved with that? Or are there dollars going back? You know, when we look at state grants, obviously, we, we would continue to support uh, more dollars to, uh, to our overall hospitality but if that's not the case specifically, is it going back to counties or, or municipalities? And you know, what, what's your recommendation on that? Yeah, so uh, the way the ARPA works is the state's getting certain funds and then uh, localities you know, like Hartford and others are getting direct money as well. 
and it's a significant amount of money. So it's still being determined how that money is going to be used. I would say right now, though, there's not the expectation of a, a new uh, business grant program with, you know, first off, the federal programs that are out there uh, and have been out there, uh, like restaurant revitalization that you just mentioned, uh, as well as, you know, we're at this reopening date. I think there's the possibility um, for certain businesses that are very, very slow to reopen because of structural changes. There, there might be some stuff we're considering, but I think one of the things, it's got you just alluded to this, but focusing on marketing dollars, th that is a real conversation we're having to market the state from a tourism uh, and travel perspective and hospitality. We think that is needed and important, especially given the pent up demand. So that is a, a real live conversation, but I don't, I don't think restaurants should be ha having conversations. I mean, they obviously can, can do what they want, but uh, there's not a state business grant program that's being envisioned right now with the ARPA dollars. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's more, you know, just helping the, especially some of the harder hit cities, um, just ideas or other things they might use those dollars for is what I talked with the mayor about and, and um, yes. those kind of conversations to help yeah. drive people the, downtown. Yeah, and listen, those cities, I mean, I, I forget the exact number I'm driving, but I think Hartford, New Haven, Bridge, I think those cities are over $100 million each, if I'm not mistaken, in terms of the funds they're getting. So if restaurants should be having that conversation if they want with their local mayor, if there's specific initiatives. But I, I just wanted to answer your question directly if there's a broad state grant program. And right now there, there is not. But mm -hmm. municipalities have a lot of money and are getting a lot of money here. So if you guys have creative ideas, please engage your local first selectman or mayor. All right. I have uh, a counterpart. Mr. Pappas has a great question. On May 1st, can someone order at a bar inside walk up service and bring their alcohol outdoors themselves? Or does a server bartender need to still do table side service for no, outdoor? Yeah. yeah, no. So, Phil, the, it, no, you, you cannot walk up to a bar indoors and then walk outdoors. So, again, we have to draw the line somewhere. So out, outdoors you can, but indoors you still need to have seated service for drinks for that 18-day period. Good question, Phil. Um, six and by the way, there's, a, there's other ways. You could, you could have a server obviously get in, you know, 12 beers at a time from a craft brewery fill and bringing it to an outdoor place and selling them there. I mean, there's ways to get creative on that, but no, we, we don't want people going up indoors to a bar until the 19th. Okay. Um, I just quick, there, the six foot spacing, everybody goes away on the 19th. Um, you know, it, it'll stay, stay in place both outdoor and inside um, until that point. But then it's, you know, if you guys saw Rhode Island, like they're going to three feet and then eliminated, we're going from six feet to no business restriction. So as I've shared with David, most of your restaurants in normal times were not in downtown Manhattan. Your restaurant spacing is always about three feet anyway, because guests don't want to have a meal with somebody else. They want to have some space. Um, but you, you go back to, to normal, um, kind of where your tables are uh, with, on May 19th, uh, where they were before. Uh, maybe I would still recommend maybe still spacing out a little bit more than normal, uh, just to make your customers feel safe and know that you're, you're easing into it. Like I had a couple people say, hey, I'm gonna put three more tables, but not all five. Um, and then we'll see how that goes. So, um, but yes, you, you the, the restrictions and then the same, I've gotten a lot of questions on bar seating. Um, you know, when you go on May 19th inside, or, um, or you know, you, you outside, you still have to keep the six foot in between parties until the 19th, but that's maybe a question you can kind of, if I'm right, David, you could have people go shoulder to shoulder. Like David and I could sit at the bar even though we didn't come together after May 19th. But a lot of people are saying, hey, I'm still just gonna remove a chair. I'm gonna make it two or three feet. Um, it's not all my chairs, but I get 80% of my chairs back. Um, yeah, that, yep. But that's up, to, that's up to the restaurateur or the bar owner. From, from the correct. state's perspective, you know, May 20th can look like a, a scene from 2019. Again, I don't think the customer wants that yet. Um, but from our perspective, you guys can, can do as you see right and fit for your clientele. Um, Scott, it's, Scott, it's Yvette. May I jump in with a couple of questions? Go ahead, Yvette. Thank you. First is um, for David, and I think you might have touched on this a bit, and I'm sorry because I was responding to questions, but I know you mentioned that the guidelines have been updated and they're on the ct.gov site, the reopening guidelines. So when those shift to recommendations, I just want to be clear um, that they will, those guidelines will still be available for anyone who wants to access them and implement any of the guidelines that are recommended by the state. They just shift to not being requirements. Is that correct? Yeah. So 
yes, with a caveat. So technically the, the long PDF that everyone saw last May 20th and last June 17th, those actually are recommendations right now. They still are up on our website and we, we will leave them up as, you know, call it recommendations or best practices. What I was referencing, Yvette, is we've added the language around May 1st and May 19th and stand up bar service at this point in time. But that long PDF, we will absolutely make that available. But even right now, that is a recommendation. The, the hard guidelines that we want folks to follow are actually on the website themselves. So this is kind of this funnel process. We've been trying to simplify these rules over the past four months. Great. No, thank you. I think there's still a lot of people just looking for some guidance that, you know, whether or not something is required right now, they still want to stick with that guidance. So I just wanted everyone to know that that's still available for you. Yes, absolutely. Thank so you. That, real quick, I have a, I actually have a, a big question I forgot to ask you, David, that does worry me in my role. Um, as the state does this, um, I've heard many rumors that towns want to still keep things required or going to come come down hard on certain uh, in their town can they I know we've had this battle uh, throughout the last 13 months about state recommendations and guidelines versus towns trying to overstep where are we with that and have you guys had conversations with with certain towns especially the ones that we know David um, are, are they going to be eligible to do more uh, than the elimination of all business restrictions yeah, so te technically, they, they, the, there's an executive order that says towns cannot do something that is inconsistent with the, what the governor is mandating. Um, but, you know, we get into this nuance here, Scott, where let's assume there is no restriction, right? And a, a new town, let's just pick Simsbury, where, where you live, or Tyler, you know, and there's a new ordinance that's created by the town council or whatever governance body, you know, technically, that's not going against the governor's executive order. So, you know, theoretically, a town could do that. I've not, I've actually not heard of this yet. So we obviously want consistent rules across the state. But for example, let's take it to its extreme. If, if a town is saying no bars can open or 50% capacity indoors, you know, absolutely elevate that to me. And I want to try to address it. But, you know, since this is not a governor's executive order, we're getting rid of executive orders. If towns wanted to create a new law, they, they technically could, as I understand it. So you and I will need to take that up if that's an issue. I hope it's not, but we'll, we'll need to address it to try to make sure we have consistent rules across the state, which is absolutely our intention. Thanks, David. And I think the reason I bring that up to David, I knew we probably have the same sidebar offline, but I, I, everyone listening in, if you start to see that, I mean, we saw that throughout the last 13 months where a town would start to make stricter guidelines or say, no, everyone has to wear a mask until they pull it down to take a drink. Uh, you know, you have to cover food before you bring it out of the kitchen. Like, like, you know, please elevate it up to, to my level and through my staff so we know because, you know, we really want consistency uh, across the board in the state of, you know, this is what we're following. These are recommendations, not requirements. Um, you know, the, the last thing we need is public health in your establishment on a Saturday night at eight o'clock um, telling you something that probably shouldn't be a rule or requirement. Trust me, I've had many, many of those uh, fun Saturday night calls, and but that's what we're here for. So. I wanted everyone to hear that so we can hopefully have consistency on May 1st and May 19th uh, moving forward. Um, you know, so, so David, yeah, I'll keep you posted. I've heard some, some grumblings. I haven't heard anything specific yet, but uh, I, I'd love to hopefully, you know, keep it statewide like we talked about as best we can. Yvette, did you have any other questions? Yeah, yes, Scott, thank you. I have two more that um, kind of came in through PMs, but they're very common questions. They're a little bit off of the May, uh, the changes coming in May. First is just um, restaurants that have been trying to help to get their staff vaccinated. Do we have any suggestions on what, what folks can do to help uh, facilitate that process? Scott, you wanna go first? You want me yeah. to start here? Yeah, David, yeah, so. Uh, the, the, my, my take of you guys right now is to reach out to your local public health department and say, what can you do? What can they do? They're actually applying for, so you know, for state grant dollars um, to, to do vaccination clinics. Um, I actually was throwing that out with someone the other day. I said, you know, they usually do like Saturday pop-ups or things like our industry is typically closed on Mondays. Um, but how do you incentivize your staff? You know, maybe they come in, you pay them a couple hours to get the vaccine type of thing, or, you know, you, they bring it to you. Um, is there, there's mobile units. I know Josh talked about that yesterday on the press conference, um, working with your local town saying, hey, we want to be a, a leader, a champion in this and help get not just my restaurant, but, you know, I've talked to all the other restaurants in the town. 
what can we do to have a vaccination day? And then maybe 21 days later, we have the Pfizer second vaccine, whatever that it can be done. Um, I'm hearing some great ideas, but I think that starts with you and your relationship um, you know, with, with the town, with your first selectman, your public health, um, start that conversation and let me know what you, the feedback, because uh, those are great opportunities to, to hopefully get more people vaccinated and showcase that we are taking the lead and, and moving that needle forward on the 60%, hopefully getting it higher. So that would be my recommendation, David. I don't know if you have more. Yeah, no, I, well, I would say two things. One, there are these mobile vans that are going around, but the, the best way to get information on, on either mobile vans or the pop-up clinics uh, is through your local health department. So I would reach out to either the first selectman or, or if you have a direct relationship with local health um, to understand where that van's going to be and when that pop-up clinic's going to be. Um, so that's part one. Part two is, you know, for the VAMs, and I realize internet access is, is not for, for, for everyone still, but there are a ton of appointments um, and, and, and lots of very close places. For example, a lot of local pharmacies, especially you know, what we'll find out today if J&J comes back online. Um, I think our view is that it should, but you, you, there's lots of appointments readily available, close appointments for those that don't want to wait for a pop-up clinic or wait for that van to come into town. So those are the two things I would recommend is, is utilize vans and do a quick search there. And then, you know, the other thing, which I think most know, but maybe not all, but CVS and, and Walgreens are, are both doing a lot of vaccinations around the state still. And those are pretty prevalent in most areas of Connecticut. So that, that, that's kind of my food for thought, but really appreciate everyone's help getting their staff vaccinated. Um, it's, it's really critical. Scott, one more question is re, uh, in regards to the um, permits. I know there were certain permits that um, had increased fees and I know, I, I don't believe we have a response just yet, but I know this was something as a CRA we've been working on. Would you be able to address that? Um, yes, I believe I got to go back through on certain permits. We're, we're looking at um, trying through legisla legislation on, you know, either delaying the permits or offsetting some of the permit costs you guys have had in the last year. Also, I've gotten rumors of permit increases, um, you know, which I, I just don't agree with, uh, as you guys definitely don't either. Like if you're increasing costs to, to run your business coming out of a pandemic, that's not, you know, in my opinion, I understand the towns are hurting, but to David's point, um, you know, a lot of these towns are going to get significant dollars to offset some of their, their own losses as well. So, uh, you know, we'll continue to work through, I believe the, the email you sent um, out of that, that came out from the CRA about the extension of May 20th from the liquor control permits. There was some extension of that through that time frame. if you go back through that email, but other permits that you guys are dealing with or you're hearing things in your town, um, that's also what we're here for. When I hear like, oh, well, we're going to have to pay extra for a parking space or they're trying to charge me this or they're trying to do this or do that. Like, you know, we get involved at that small level. I remember certain towns wanted to, we're doing free parking, you know, when we had outdoor dining and then wanted to start charging and then increase the, the parking fees. Um, you know, like that should be the last thing that should be done. We want to encourage people to get back there. I get that they need to, to balance their budget, but like if I can help in those conversations, especially when you know certain towns are getting ARP money, you know, what are they doing on the flip side to maybe offset your permit costs? What are they doing to, to help you be more business friendly and help you stay in business? Um, I can't really answer specifically to a one specific permit or bill of that, but that would be my, my feedback to everybody here. Uh, I see Stephanie Hayes' question. Stephanie, please reach out to us offline. Um, you know, it looks like the town's trying to prohibit the sale of business on sidewalks, even though you were able to do that. Um, you know, that, that's it's a little bit more into the weeds, but we can look at what the expanded outdoor dining bill did versus what the town's doing down where you are, um, you know, in, in that area, Stephanie. So please, uh, please reach out to us, see how we can help. Um, because I think there's a little bit of caveat to David's point where towns could still find ways around it to say, oh, well, yes, but we're going to make this mandate for a sidewalk because of X. So we have to try to help, help each of you guys through that. And that, that's what we do as well. So I uh, hope that answers that question, Stephanie, and, and stay in touch offline. Have that any other questions? Uh, nope, Scott, I think we're good. Okay. Uh, of course, if we missed anybody um, or you have additional questions, you can always send to info at ctrestaurant.org and we'll get your questions answered. Um, well, listen, I, yeah, David, I think had a 10 o'clock. So the fact that he stayed on uh, longer, I appreciate it, David. Um, any Anything else that, that you need to say today? 
Uh, no, listen, again, you guys have been great partners and appreciate everything the restaurant industry's done. And I, I think we, uh, we've got a lot to be optimistic about. I, I really appreciate your help on vaccines. And that's the one ask for me, I would say, is, you know, anything you can do to enable vaccinations for your staff, to encourage it for customers, you know, where appropriate. Again, it's not a mandate, as Scott said, but we're, we're all a lot better off. These vaccines are incredibly safe and they are incredibly effective. Uh, so that's really the key to our full reopening and having a really great summer. So thanks again, and we'll, we'll be in touch. Thank you, David, and everybody else. Just as a quick screenshot here um, of emails, addresses for our whole team uh, at the CRA. Um, uh, please, please do not hesitate to reach out for anything. Um, this has been recorded as well. So if you want to go back through, you missed something, uh, we'll have a couple more. Keep it, but my other last comment besides vaccine and being a PSA is RRF. Start working on your application, your sample application now, um, because it's going to open and it's a first come first serve. Um, and I want to get every, you know, selfishly, I want to lead the country in amount of applications per capita. Uh, but that's only on you guys of getting this stuff done and being accurate with it and using the SBDC, using SBA, uh, using David's team as well, and us to try to get that through. Um, and we'll go from there. So uh, it looks like the weather is beautiful out here, at least up here in Simsbury today. Um, I hope you guys have a great weekend. Um, you know, continue to keep us posted on the worker shortage. I know that's an issue. We're going to continue to work on that one um, and, and help you guys any way that we can. Uh, and other than that, have a great weekend. And we will talk, I'm sure, at some point next week with another webinar on RRF. So thanks again, David, and thank, thank you to everybody else.